Welcome, everyone. Welcome to another special episode here of the Left Lens. Uh, this is the National Day of Mourning, otherwise known as Thanksgiving. Um, I am here, as you can see, but, uh, with Pepe Escobar, independent journalist and political analyst. And we have a lot to talk about, but uh, I hear there's an echo. I don't know if it is. Um, on your side, Pepe, your headphones are plugged in. Yes, they are, and I turned off everything else. Okay. Hmm. It's. I think it's. Let's see if I mute you. What happens? Okay. Uh, hold on. Let me see. Do we still hear the echo? No, it went away. So. It might be on. It might be on your side, Pepe. I don't know. This stuff can happen. Um, let's see. Is it continuing? No. 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 Well, no. No. Okay. Some people are saying it's better that there is some a little bit of an echo. Um, but what I can do, I won't be talking all that much, uh, so I can <laughs> I can definitely be flexible uh, uh, with the mute when I am speaking. But uh, Pepe, how how are you doing today? Uh, well, I'm back to NATO stand. Uh, I'm back in Paris. I was in Asia for the past two months, so I'm here for my fourth day. It was the first day that I actually left home. <laughs> I was afraid to leave home. <laughs> so, uh, well, it uh, remains the same. Uh, uh, you, you don't feel the crisis, but you feel inflation, of mm. course. And, uh, and people are slightly more tense than they were a few months ago. That's uh, it's obvious, you know, especially now that winter is coming right. and uh, France of uh, 56 nuclear power stations in France, only 28 apparently are working. So maybe we're going to have power cuts in January. <laughs> uh, it seems like it. Well, well, let's let's get right into this then, uh, uh, Pepe, because you have been writing a whole bunch and before uh, we get started everyone make sure you're liking this video make sure you're subscribing to the channel of course be sure as well to support independent media uh, by us uh, on patreon you can also find all kinds of links in the description send a super chat all of that good stuff but let's talk about what you've been writing about Pepe, because I took special interest in your uh, most recent article in the cradle talking about uh, the end of the G20 and the rise of BRICS plus. Right. So I, could you talk about the first, maybe the rise of BRICS plus, because we've had a lot of conversation. We've even had Saudi Arabia, right. Uh, being kind of uh, uh, open to the idea of no, joining. They're dying to get in. Yeah, they're desperate to get it. <laughs> so yeah. there's a lot going on with brick. I mean, I remember not too long ago, right, five, seven years ago, where bricks was not so much a headline story. It was kind of a newer development. Now it feels like with the Ukraine crisis, things have accelerated a lot. You have Iran, right. you have uh, Algeria, Argentina. Uh, you know, a lot of these countries are submitting their applications and, and both Russia, China and, and, and the BRICS countries are saying, well, uh, we're going to figure out how to incorporate. How and to, then, yeah, it's, a, it's a very complex process. Yeah. yeah. So can you talk about this process? Why is this happening? Why are more countries joining BRICS or wanting to join BRICS at this time? Well, uh, I'll try to make it very short because uh, we would have to start, in fact, in the 2000s when BRICS was uh, started and especially when BRICS, uh, BRIC, the original BRIC, the original four, became BRICS with the uh, incorporation of South Africa. And it took a long time to, to solidify this uh, alliance of four countries in different continents and establish a long-term plan. And this is something that is, uh, is coming to fruition these past few years, and especially this year, and especially after this, uh, this special military operation in Ukraine. Because as everybody knows, everybody with a, with a working brain knows, the global South did not follow the collective West, or at least NATO stun, as I call them, in their fury against Russia, which was a mix of uh, anger, uh, Russophobia, and uh, absolutely misguided policies, anything you can imagine. Um, South America, 
Africa, Southeast Asia, Central Asia, uh, West Asia, what, what we call the Middle East, most of them were either uh, uh, impartial or in the background, of course, they were more or less uh, uh, not endorsing 100% what Russia was doing, but understanding Russian motives. And this, the merit of all that is Russian diplomacy. As we all know, Russia has probably the, the, the number one diplomatic team in the world. It's absolutely unbeaten, you know. No, nobody can compete with them in terms of the, the, the breadth, the, 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 depth, the depth of knowledge, uh, the fact that they are real diplomats, they are, they are very skilled in even convincing adversaries uh, on their merits, you know, on, on intellectual merits always. And this is very, very important. The fact that now we have a, a conjunction of an institutional conjunction of several organizations that are merging more or less and getting their act together for the first time since the beginning of the millennium, in fact. So we have BRICS, of course, and the development of what we call BRICS Plus, which is a concept, as a concept, this came from Russia a few years ago. It started to be debated inside Russia at the highest levels, the level of Valdai Club, for instance, the, the, the best Russian think tank, uh, the Russian uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs. Uh, the Chinese are, always love the idea because they see BRICS Plus as an expansion towards the Global South. Uh, uh, the problem was always how to get uh, India on it on the bandwagon and once again russia diplomacy of course because don't forget that the, the original uh, uh, nexus of uh, brick was ric was ric russia mm -hmm. india china and then that evolved into brick and then bricks so once again what the R russian diplomats were doing was trying to bridge the gaps and there are many gaps between beijing and Delhi, and they succeeded. And now uh, Modi and the party, uh, the, the BJP, are fully behind a very strong BRICS and in favor of expansion of BRICS as well. So now we have BRICS, we have the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, we have the Eurasian Economic Union, uh, we have the, the institutional uh, financial arrangements like uh, Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank and the BRICS New Development Bank, NDB, which is the BRICS answer to the World Bank. Yeah. Mm. Um, and, of course, the, the Russian concept of Greater Eurasia Partnership. This is the official Russian concept, which runs in parallel to the, Belt and, the Chinese Belt and Road. Of course, the, the breadth of the Chinese Belt and Road uh, especially because they started earlier. They started nine years ago, first in Kazakhstan and then in Indonesia, in Jakarta. And it's practically, a, now BRI is practically a global project. And Russia, basically, their idea is the idea that they have, even before the Chinese, let's build a free market between uh, Lisbon and Vladivostok. The Russians were already talking about this in the 2000s. Like, you know, uh, uh, BRI came in 2013. So the Chinese obviously were paying attention. What they have is Russia, what Russia doesn't have, they have the financial muscle to implement a project of trade and connectivity across Eurasia, different parts of Eurasia, all the way to Europe, and also including Africa and parts of Latin America as well. That's what BRI is. And it's not an accident that after COVID, Xi Jinping a few days ago said, next year, we're going to have another Belt and Road Forum, which was canceled during the pandemic. Which, so from now on, they are, the Chinese are already thinking the next year we're going to have even more countries interested in BRICS. And the countries that are partners, which are over 130, plus a lot of organizations as well, Okay, let's uh, start new projects as well. Finish, finish the ones that are on the road, 
Uh, for instance, they, they are going to finish a very, very important uh, BRI project, which is the Jakarta-Bandung High-Speed Railway, which is the extreme part. It's the first high-speed rail in Indonesia. Indonesia is an enormous archipelago country. This is the first one of many in the future, built by the Chinese, with Chinese know-how. Uh, the, the trains are coming from China. And Xi Jinping and, Pre and President Jokowi last week, they went for a test run, yep. which was very successful, and it's going to be inaugurated next year. So this is only one example of, uh, you know, things are going to start to pick up again. So we have all these organizations sinking in unison and very, very important. This is the subtract of the whole thing. The financial angle, which is now BRICS, SCO, Eurasia Economic uh, Union. They are all thinking in terms of let's get a new currency on the market. We need to bypass the US dollar. We need a currency that is based in commodities. And we all have commodities, most, most of us. And gold, or maybe gold and commodities. Of course, this is a long-term process, but the train has already left the station, you know. And one of the very few in the world that is tracking it in detail is Professor Michael Hudson. He's been writing brilliant stuff about that for almost a year now. And there are very few, in the US, there are very few that are keeping up with what Michael is doing, in fact. Mm -hmm. And you, you see Chinese economists, of course, writing about it, Russian economists, Iranian economists, and the fact that they are getting to, Pakistani, you, the fact that they are getting together and discussing it together in, in, inside these different forums. There's a discussion inside BRICS. There's a discussion inside the SEO. There's another one inside the Eurasia Economic Union. So sooner or later, and sooner would be maybe starting next year all the way to 2024, they have to start getting these teams together. And then I say, look, we need a unifying approach, and we need to find a single currency for all our mm -hmm. members. And that would include the SEO members. Uh, Countries like Turkey, which is a, an observer at the SEO, but want to get in. The BRICS, as you mentioned in the beginning, which has now already a gigantic list of people who want to get in. Not only the ones that we already know, like Algeria, Argentina, and Iran. They all applied officially. Right. But, you know, Indonesia, they applied in Bali last week during the G20. Thailand, they applied later last late last week in bangkok during apec so, so you know so every week or month you have new countries and there's an enormous list, enormous list that includes a lot of african countries kazakhstan in central asia which is a key country because kazakhstan yeah. already belongs to the belt and road and to the Eurasia economic union and a list of south americans as well an enormous south american list everybody wants it because would be uh, uh, in terms of integrating their economies with Brazil as well. And with Brazil and Argentina, the big uh, South American heav heavyweights, they have even more opportunities of having, for instance, Russia, India, China, investing even more in their own nations as well. So it's a, co a convergence of uh, interests. And it happens to be in 2022. It, I'm putting a very long story short, Danny. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and it comes amid amid the Ukraine situation, which yes. is ongoing. And you you just published an article about this, and and I'd like to get your opinion on the relationship because it seems like a lot of this has sped up quite dramatically. And the G20, and you wrote about the G20. Um, uh, it seemed to be almost like this forum that where this phenomena this this development of uh, all of these countries you call it the global south effect you, yes. you you talk about china and russia kind of moving with a lot of the world uh, uh, by their side away from this model of unipolarity and so you know you wrote a, an article in strategic culture called electric war just published today i'll pull it up but could you talk about the relationship between uh, this war and, and this 
uh, really what it seems to be a, a rapidly intensifying development uh, yes. of integration of the global south like what's the connection here well the global south has been examining and analyzing what's happening between russia and nato not russia and ukraine very carefully uh, the main players, ap apart from uh, Russia and China, Iran, Pakistan, India, Turkey, uh, the key South American players, uh, apart from, from Brazil, the key African players, everyone in West Asia, everyone in the Persian Gulf, uh, starting with Saudi Arabia, which wants to become a BRICS member, they already applied. And what do they see? They, they, they do understand that this is a, a sort of existential clash, as it is. They understand that if, by unforeseen reasons, Russia would collapse in this fight against you, NATO, not against Ukraine. But let's uh, suppose that uh, NATO wins <laughs> we, we, we don't know how because they don't have the manpower, they don't have the troops, uh, they, right. they don't have enough technology, they are not going to invade Russia. But, but okay, let's assume that uh, Russia for some reason folds and loses and NATO gets what they wanted from the beginning, which is to turn uh, Ukraine into a rabbit uh, anti-Russia base with missiles deployed all over pointing against Russia. Let's suppose that will happen. The next step would be China doing the same thing against China, using Taiwan as they are using Ukraine as a pawn in their game, to quote Dylan once again. So this is something that if you discuss this with the, the intellectual elites in uh, Lebanon, in Tehran, uh, in Islamabad, or in Buenos Aires, they understand this, for them it's crystal clear. Like, you know, it's like Russia is a sort of uh, putting use the word uh, in, in one of his speeches. He uh, he never uses the term revolutionary. He said, and I'm quoting him uh, you know, directly, the situation in many respects is revolutionary. And it is because now you have a sort of uh, a revolutionary <laughs> vanguard of course we can discuss this for for ages but basically the vanguard in terms of fighting the collective west absolutely by themselves the russians are not getting help from anybody they are fighting the whole nato machinery which is uh, embedded and embodied by the ukrainian army which is not the ukrainian army anymore this is a nato army essentially with the best of the best and the best intelligence that they have. And Russia is fighting them, you know, straight away, straight to the point. And they know that uh, the next step would be something that already started in terms of cultural war and in terms of uh, uh, a demonization campaign, a xenophobic campaign, yeah. which came after the Iranophobic campaign of the early 2000s and the Russophobic campaign, which is ongoing. So they can understand this very, very well. So, so they know that uh, what does the West propose? Nothing. The West is indebted. It's fearful. Uh, in terms of the American empire, we have a, a hugely indebted empire that uh, it may be starting to see that the free lunch is over. The 75-year-old free lunch is no more. Uh, and what do they see uh, on the Eurasian side? Not only Russia, but very, very important. The solidification of the strategic partnerships between Russia, China, and Iran. Now, th these three, they have interlocking strategic partnerships. And if we add India, we have a strategic partnership between India and Iran and a strategic partnership between Russia and India as well. So... These are the four main players in Eurasia. Turkey would like to be the fifth, but the problem is they're still hedging their bets. And this is something that we could discuss yeah. <laughs> also for hours, how <laughs> Erdogan is hedging his bets all the time. But if he's elected, if he's re-elected next year, this is going to change drastically.
drastically because then he's going to see, okay, now that I'm reelected, I can do whatever I want. I'm going to catch the Eurasia train because this is the future. I'm not going to I'm not, I'm not going to be a sub NATO member forever and a no European Union member and I don't want to get into the European Union for what? <laughs> you know. Yeah, so this so point, this is right? what's changing all the time Danny. Yeah. Yeah, I mean let's let's talk a little bit more about Turkey and India because these two countries occupy very interesting positions. India has been a thorn in the U.S. side, especially because I think the expectation was with the Quad. With the Quad, uh, you, you you call you call um, you know Russia, Iran, China, and India the real Quad. Uh, yes. But the U.S.'s Quad, I think uh, Biden hoped that India would be much more compliant. But in the wake of the Ukraine. A proxy war, India has been very adversarial around that, has not played ball when it comes to Ukraine. And, uh, and India and China just settled what was a very intense border dispute. Uh, yes. And while, as you said, there are many differences, it seems like when it comes to India and Turkey, which uh, I would love to hear your thoughts about why Turkey does so much he uh, 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 hedge betting, because uh, you know, of its role in Syria and all sorts of other uh, uh, cases. But, you know, these two countries kind of stand at this line, I feel like, of multipolarity and unipolarity. And I'm wondering what you think their role is moving forward, especially as the Ukraine proxy war moves into this next phase, this winter where the EU um, is moving into collapse. And NATO is talking about more weapons, more weapons, more weapons. They don't. More, they don't have <laughs> that. They don't have, but they're talking about increasing military budgets, right? So to, to basically sell off Europe, Europe's economies to and NATO's economies to uh, military industrial complex. Like, what is Turkey and India's role from here, and and, and how do you see things developing with them? Uh, these are two extremely interesting cases. Like, uh, in, in fact, Istanbul is now my third base. Uh, I live between. Paris and Bangkok as bases, one for NATO stand, one for, for Asia, Southeast Asia. And now, and since the beginning of the year, I added Istanbul because it's absolutely crucial. First of all, the city itself is a crossroads of 80% uh, of the world. Everybody is there or is always uh, transiting in Istanbul. So you get everything from... Uh, uh, jihadis, uh, Uyghurs, uh, Central Asians from everywhere, um, Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, Ethiopians. Uh, it, it's wonderful. And in terms of absorbing information and, co and confronting information, it's absolutely outstanding. Uh, well, Erdogan, of course, uh, he's a wily player, very, very clever, and he's a master of hedging bets. The problem is he cannot... Uh, from what, simply one day to another, abandon NATO and join the Eurasia train. Mm. First of all, for, because of a very important internal reason. It's something that I confirmed in Istanbul earlier this year. I didn't know about that. I was shocked, and I had to confirm this with a lot of people to be really convinced. 90% of the Turkish establishment is pro-NATO. So obviously, even if you are Erdogan and you have nearly unlimited powers like a, a neo sultan, yeah, you have to think very, very clearly about how you're going to make your move. So what is he doing at the moment? He's not antagonizing NATO. He's not antagonizing the U.S. Uh, um, uh, face to face, for instance, his latest operation against terror terrorism, as defined by Ankara in uh, Syria and in Iraq, the Americans didn't say anything about it. The, in fact, the official American position is Turkey has the right to defend itself. We heard this before right? many times, right? So now that applies to Turkey. So this means that uh, the dialogue between Turkish NATO generals with the rest of NATO and the Americans is there. At the same time, of course, Erdogan is looking at Central Asia, where he wants to, to become a, a, a cultural 
force as strong as Russia and China that is making inroads as well. This is the Turkey Council angle, which is fascinating. Uh, recently, he was uh, in um, uh, Samarkand again for uh, a Turkey Council meeting. Uzbekistan is part of it as well. So uh, the thing is, when I was in Uzbekistan three months ago, for instance, you don't see a Turkish presence over there, and people don't even relate to Tur they relate. They they love Turkish tourists, or if they have a chance to go to Istanbul as tourists, great. But it's not that Turkey is a very important power in Central Asia, in Kazakhstan or Uzbekistan, the two most important Central Asian nations. But uh, Erdogan wants more business. He wants uh, Turkish companies investing more in Central Asia, and he wants a cultural presence of Turkish culture. In fact, neo-Ottoman Turkish culture present all over uh, Central Asia. And of course, he's looking at Russia as, okay, I can be a mediator between Russia and the West. We're not getting there yet, but Erdogan is working on it specifically that's why at the moment he poses as a mediator between kiev and moscow it was working until of course they they the usual suspect pulled the plug on uh, ukraine and russia having diplomatic discussions and it was in istanbul you remember that in istanbul there was the beginning of a deal between moscow and kiev yeah. and lavrov refers to that all the time. Look, we were almost not clinching a deal, but at least we were talking. The next day, literally, came the order came from Washington and from the minions in London as well. Cut it off. No dialogue. No diplomacy. You know. So uh, the Turks are still trying to. Okay, if there is a mediation, we are going to be the mediator between the collective West and Moscow. And the thing is, uh, uh, the relationship that Erdogan developed with Putin, it's it's very straightforward. It's, uh, of course, it's very hard to trust Erdogan, as we know, right? But Erdogan, I think he he went out of his way to prove to Putin that he can be trusted. For instance, he negotiated the 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 two different uh, grain deals. One with Ukraine and the UN, and the other one with Russia and the UN. So Erdogan negotiated both of these, you know. And of course, the Ukrainians broke their part of the deal later with that attack on the Russian Black Sea fleet, you know. Yeah. So this was not Turkey's fault, you know. And the Turks were pissed with that, of course, because after, after all, they were the, the guarantors of the Ukrainian side. But the thing is, nothing that Kiev does. You cannot trust anything they say or they don't say or they say they will do or the, the information they disseminate. But everything coming from Kiev is a lie. That's the that's the problem. And even and even now, people deciding people in uh, in Brussels and in Washington, they're starting to see to get the picture. Finally, yeah? not to mention the corruption. Not to mention those, those the aid that disappears in uh, uh, in accounts in the Cayman Islands or whatever, you know. So er, the fact that Erdogan is playing all this at the same time, and on top of it, now he's playing uh, anti-terrorism operations in Syria and in, in northern Iraq as well. It's 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 crazy. The amount of stuff that he's juggling at the same time is mind-boggling. But uh, what I discussed with my Kemalist friends in Istanbul, in fact, they're all anti-Erdogan, but they recognize that his, his game at the moment is, is very hard to beat. It's the elections. If he's re-elected, he'll have a free hand, and then he can go Eurasian. And there's not much the Americans will be able to do after that. And, and, mm -hmm. and back to your question about India. India understood that in terms of sovereignty, it was very, it's a very, very simple equation. Are you going to be sovereign if you are a part of BRICS or BRICS Plus and the Shanghai Cooperation Organization and this whole high-speed rail Eurasian train coming together? Or are you going to be subordinated to the Americas and the Brits within the Quad? And even worse, you are excluded from AUKUS which is what really matters for the Americas. It's the Americas, the Brit, the Brits and the Australians. No India at AUKUS, no Japan at AUKUS. So you're going to be a second-rate uh, vassal 
or you're going to be a sovereign. So it's 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 straight to the point. It's something that a political leader understands like that, not Danny. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And let's let's pivot to the to the G20 a bit because I feel like one of the things you said in your article about the G20 is uh, you know you talked about the, how this is all developing, how there is this uh, uh, you know really assertion of sovereignty going on. Mm-hmm with India, Turkey. Um, but you even had, for example, you even had Japan and China kind of publicly at this forum talk to each other. Talk to you each know, other. When I, when I, and it was very public. It wasn't just some, you know, it was a very, I think it was very significant, especially for China because the relations had been, had been so sour for so long. Um, but, you know, it feels like what you're talking about is that these countries that, maybe wanted a seat at the table of the American empire are now more and more realizing that uh, there's no, there's really no chairs for them. Like the, when no. I think about the quad, I do think of kind of an insignificant alliance. Like it's very, it, to me, it feels insignificant because it doesn't seem to have a purpose. It doesn't seem to have much coordination. It doesn't seem like much comes out of something like yeah. the quad while AUKUS they came out with all sorts of, and it was mainly military, all sorts of security tell, deals, it, all it, sorts it, of arrangements. Yeah. Even if they feel very far flung out in the future, uh, they made they really made you know those very uh, uh, Anglo-Saxon countries like they made a a, a real effort to uh, solidify their cooperation. Surprise, surprise. So, could you talk about the G twenty? Because you talk about how this. Uh, formation, or maybe we could call so-called formation, so-called alliance, is crumbling right now. And, and this particular G20 summit was significant in that way. Could you talk about how that happened and maybe a little bit about the biden she meeting? Because it seems like there was so much about that which signified the, the, the directions of uh, the differing directions that the American empire is going in versus China and the global south. Yeah. Uh, the the backstories at the G20 were fascinating, fascinating. Uh, I'm going to select two to tell all of you. Uh, I'm not sure if, if this was reported in detail in American media. I, I don't remember reading in the, on the Washington Post or New York Times about that. The 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 collective West arrived in Bali, and this is this is something that I heard from diplomats. I cannot I, I cannot say who. They said, look, the, the Europeans and the Americans arrived here and they hijacked the G20 even before they arrived at the airport. They turned the G20 into an anti-Russian operation. This is what they wanted to do. So the Indonesians, which are immensely uh, gracious, you know, uh, n- compromising, non-confrontational, extremely polite, they don't want nobody to lose face. You know, it's the epitome of a very sophisticated ancient uh, Asian culture. How are we going to deal with these uh, barbarians, in fact? So uh, other diplomats from Asia especially, they knew what was coming. And they said, look, we're going to have to unite because uh, everything has to be submitted to a vote and we have to stick together. So the first thing was the for instance, there, w- there was not a G20 declaration. Everybody knew from the beginning because this thing was already polarized. But there was a, st- a final statement. I don't know if you, if you remember. It was a very long final statement with 52 points. Gigantic text, you know. But the, p- the key points were right in the beginning, I think on point three, if I remember well, uh, w- w- they were all about condemning Russia from the beginning of the state. So what we had at the table when they start to discuss at the level of heads of state was practically a tie according to 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 what diplomats told us it was more or less 10 against 10. so there was absolutely no way that they were going to have a statement condemning russia and it was fascinating to see the 10 against 10 because it was basically the collective west plus the european union plus two vassals Australia and Japan against the total, uh, the whole global South that was represented at, G, at the G20. 
So in the end, they diluted what the Europeans and the Americans wanted to impose. And they condemned the war in Ukraine, not the Russian war on Ukraine. So this was very, very important. And they were discussing this when Lavrov was still there. Lavrov left one day before. So when Lavrov left, he already knew that the final declaration would not be an accusation against Russia. And obviously, China campaigned heavily against the initial draft of the declaration, which, which was basically a draft uh, heavily influenced by the, Europe, the Americans and the Europeans. And the Chinese from the beginning said, no, if you don't change this, we're not going to sign. Can you imagine a declaration, a statement uh, not signed by Xi Jinping himself who arrived at the G20? Bali was like Versailles. Xi Jinping was the Sun King. Everybody wanted to prostrate in front of the Sun King. Everybody wanted an audience, a meeting. Blah, blah, blah. Well, yep. and, and, all, and the Chinese were very, very forceful. We're not here to discuss the war on Ukraine. This is a meeting about uh, problems with supply chains, uh, uh, COVID, sustainable development. So this is not, we're not discussing the war on Ukraine. So, the Chinese were very, very important. And of course, all the other global south, they were thinking in unison. And the Indonesians, because they were the chair, of course, they, they had the moral high ground to say, no, uh, this is our summit. We are responsible for everything here. We're not going to have this thing degenerate into a shouting match. So this was the first thing. The, sec the second very important point, which more or less confirms the first point, you remember that right in the middle of the G20 was the famous uh, missile incident, yeah. which which yeah. was built from the beginning as Russian missiles dropping in Poland with no confirmation whatsoever, including that. Uh, okay, let's let's uh, bald faced lie by AP, which went all over the world. Yeah, uh, and then they had to print a retraction. Well. You remember that there was an emergency meeting on the sidelines of the G20. And guess who was not there? The whole global south. It was only Biden, uh, von, der, von der Lugen, Pustula von der Lugen, la, la dominatrix of the European Commission, and Canada, Japan, the, the usual vassals, etc., and Europeans. Nobody from the global south. So for me, in fact, this was even more important than the, the backroom discussions about the state because it proves that uh, the warmongers are the collective West. Mm -hmm. And even they get a special meeting inside a, a global meeting with the so-called 20 most powerful nations in the world. They hijack it. They hijack the meeting. In, they hijack a meeting inside the meeting to mm -hmm. discuss something where they don't have even evidence. It's, it's com completely crazy. And obviously, the Indonesians notice, the Chinese notice, uh, the, the Indians notice. Uh, I cannot talk about Brazil because Brazil was non-represented because they have a non-government at the moment. Uh, but yeah. if Lula was there, Lula would be one of the most outspoken critics of this me meeting, hijacking a meeting. So yeah. uh, I think these two points uh, show to all of you how the global south is looking at this uh, rabbit confrontation between NATO Stan, the collective West, led by the Americans, against Russia. And what, what could signify in the near future uh, uh, the, the very remote, practically a non-existent possibility that Russia would fold? They know. And, th and, th and then comes the very, very important theme of sovereignty. They look at Russia affirming their sovereignty. And when they were listening to uh, Xi Jinping's speech on the um, uh, Communist Party Congress talking about peaceful modernization, where Xi Jinping was not imposing the Chinese model to the global south, he was telling the whole global south, in fact, the speech was not only for a Chinese internal audience, but for the whole world. Xi Jinping was basically saying, look, we have a successful model. Uh, you, you can study our model, you can learn from our successes and our mistakes as well, but then you're going to come up with your own 
uh, national model, which may have nothing to do with ours. You know, right. everybody in the global south paid extreme attention to this. It was probably the most important thing in, in his speech. So when when you add this speech to what happened at the, the, the G20, you you see the framework of how the absolute majority of the global power is thinking, and you understand why everybody is lining up to become a BRICS Plus member and an SEO member. Yeah, you know, it's a, it's a direct consequence. <laughs> totally, and it, from I mean, there were the G twenty, there was the ASEAN summit. We had Biden in Cambodia. Yes. Calling the 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 prime minister of Cambodia, the prime minister of Colombia. The prime minister of Colombia. <laughs> you you had uh, Biden. I, there were representatives of the U.S. So Biden skipped out on the APEC um, economic leaders meeting. Um, there was just a lack of. It felt like a lack of seriousness, and that yes. even reading the readout of Joe Biden's administration after the three and a half hour meeting with Xi Jinping, it still felt like a a, a very uh, unserious, unserious attempt yeah. at, uh, and I said it last night, I said that this shows that the U.S. and Europe and NATO, uh, they they don't know how to do diplomacy because but they really, don't, they, don't, they don't do diplomacy then. Yeah, they, 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 they don't, don't do know, it. They, they forgot the art of diplomacy. It's basically right. sanctions. Uh, uh, like, you know, in the, uh, the Department of State, since the Pompeo uh, era, it's the Department of Sanctions. They don't talk to anybody. And they don't talk to the so-called enemies or existential threats. They just... <laughs> okay, it's threats and sanctions. And this is something that, uh, especially in uh, Asian cultures in general, everywhere from Ankara to Vladivostok and everywhere in the middle, people understand that. And... These are non-confrontational cultures, essentially, very sophisticated. You know, coming, coming, some of them coming from millennia. They are adept at trade. They are adept at talking to the other, and they are adept at exercising diplomacy. And they are horrified, and they see that. What do they see? They see a cornered empire that is getting even more paranoid because it's a self-isolating, in fact that has absolutely no interest to, to, to at, even listen to other nations and regions' interests. And when they come up with a so-called policy, it's something like the Quad or AUKUS, which is military policy, just like their policy to Africa is AFRICOM, military policy once again. They are not talking about connectivity. They are not talking about increasing trade. They are not talking about sustainable development, nothing. Nothing. And, uh, of course, uh, people who live in the United States, they are insulated because of American mainstream media uh, isolates people from the rest of the world. And uh, no wonder the, the famous thing that most Americans cannot point to other countries on a map. It's true because they are not fed the right information from the beginning since they were in school, obviously. You know. But uh, the rest of the world is different. You know, uh, no. A, 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 a simple example, Thailand or Malaysia, for instance, in Southeast Asia, even if they have uh, problems in their educational systems, but people know a little bit about the rest of the world. And, yeah. and obviously this uh, tradition of uh, trying to, to cope with the other, trying to understand the other, which, which is the essential, the, the basic principle of diplomacy, you know, discuss, sitting on the same table and discussing, and everybody has an equal voice, which is something that you see in uh, um, uh, assemblies uh, in village terms in the middle of Java, for instance. This is a form of diplomacy, which is something that you see in, a, in an Afghan village as well, when you have a shura with uh, all, all the clerics and the members of the uh, general population. It's a form of dip diplomacy. You can raise your hand and you can talk about it and express your point of view. E even that is disappearing from, 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 the, uh, from the US elites. Uh, let's not generalize. From the psychos who right. kidnapped the, the so-called American dream. And it's a very... Uh, small reduced band of cycles unfortunately and the best american minds know that but of course they are a minority 
or they are excluded from mainstream media. Right. But, you know, the, the, the best thinkers in the U.S. know exactly what's going on uh, for decades, in fact. And it's not going to change because now, we, we, for instance, now when, we, when you have this administration and this State Department and most of the CIA literally kidnapped by these cycles, war-mongering cycles, where they think it's possible to launch a proxy war against Russia on Russia Western borderlands and get away with it. And there will be no response, or even worse, which is something we have we have seen for the past few weeks. You can launch a limited nuclear war and get away with it. But yes. Just, well, apart from these cycles, they are dumb as <laughs> you know. It's 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 a surreal, it's a tragic surrealist situation. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know. Uh, uh... Uh, I know we have about 10, 15 more minutes. I wanted to ask you about a question that someone, a subscriber of mine uh, wanted to know. And, okay. and they, they want to ask a big question. And I think a lot of your work gets to this. Do you think that this is, do you think that the U.S. you know, led uh, Collective West, their attempt to keep unipolar hegemony mainly with these u.s elites that you're talking about uh as, as they all operate basically as vassals do you yeah. think that this is going to lead to some kind of nuclear exchange because of course we've i mean even that poland missile attack that ukraine conducted whether it was an accident or not nevertheless yeah. the reaction by kiev and by zelensky was let's do uh let's do what we can to get nato involved article five of the constitution let's let's have a real war with russia which most people agree would lead to some kind of a uh, world war three situation do you feel like that's where this struggle is heading because you talk a lot we haven't even spoken since the uh, uh pipeline attack as well the Nord Stream yeah. pipeline attack like all of the these escalations, the fact that NATO, as you said, and the U.S., as you said, they don't do diplomacy. And given that they can't arrest this process, they can't arrest China, Russia, Iran, and now much of the global south moving in a direction away from the U.S. and away from this unipolar order because, one, it's a necessity, and two, it makes a lot of sense. So they can't arrest that process. But it seems like they're going to go out uh, kicking and screaming violently as this occurs. So do you think it's heading toward a, a situation where there will be a great confrontation to the level that could lead to nuclear war? Because I think a lot more people, even in the West, are concerned about that, whether they're concerned for the right reasons or they understand the overall situation is another story. But I, I was wondering your thoughts about it. Well, uh it's crazy that, that when you think that uh, maybe the the faction that is preventing the whole thing to derail are a few Pentagon generals, because they are realists. They are realists. They they understand the real politic. Uh, I'm sure many of them understand that the next the next war if it's nuclear is going to be the last like putin said and right. keeps repeating they understand that uh, uh, the hypersonic missiles that russia has if they carry nuclear warheads the results if there is an attack on Amer on america are going to be absolutely devastating they already game that of course so obviously they are refraining these cycles which are ideological people who had no military background and one of the few people in the world who's been pointed to it over and over again is um, martianov my friend martianov was one of the best military analysts in the world with writing in english that's a great thing um, and some of the best american uh, independent analysts like uh, McGregor, like uh, Scott Ritter, like Larry Johnson, they also know that. So if they know that, the, the you know, people at the highest level in the Pentagon, they know that as well. 
as and of course cia is different because the cia is highly ideological and cia is basically a subversion mechanism they are not they're not thinking about long-term effects of their actions but the military they they have to think about that because this would involve certainly a, a nuclear exchange and everybody's going to be toast <laughs> so the, it comes back to the same problem who hijacked american foreign policy and is this unhijackable <laughs> for, for the future? Can we get rid of these people? Apparently not. Mm. First of all, because these people, they answer to higher powers. And these higher powers are financial powers. And they are part of the international financial system. They control the international financial system. And these guys, the so uh, what Tom Wolf in the 80s called masters of the universe this this masters of the universe 2.0 gang there we don't know exactly what they want uh, what we know about what they want is the davos great reset scam and it was not an accident that bond villain klaus schwab was at the g20 and he was one of the main speakers of the B20, which is the business forum attached to the G20. And what did uh, Klaus Schwab say once again? We are in a process of changing the world. So the narrative stays the same. Of course, they don't call it Great Reset anymore. They call it the Great Narrative, his own words and his own mantra. So, you know, so he goes anywhere he wants, including the G20, for instance. And can you, can you imagine the Indians, the Indonesians uh, listening, <laughs> the Argentinians listening to this? Okay, but uh, who gave you the power to change the world? Who are you? You know, and he, sa and he says that with a straight face. And we need to ch we need to change the world, and we we need to. Uh, there's going to to be a rev not rev he doesn't say revolutionary, but uh, the world that we are living and we are used to is not going to exist soon. And this uh, platonic <laughs> platonic republic self elected elite is going to conduct it. So that means uh, Davos man as we know it, no? the international financial system, and even worse, the guys who never, uh, the guys who really run the show and never show up, who control the international financial system. This means the guy, the guys way behind of BlackRock, Vanguard, State Street, the, 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 the usual um, high stakes players, right? So, so that's the problem. We, uh, all of us, especially in the global south, we have no idea what they what they really want to implement. We 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 understand the framework, and we understand that uh, how they they from the beginning they were manipulating COVID. From the beginning, they are manipulating the war of NATO against Russia. What do they plan to get out of uh, COVID cancel culture? uh collapse of european economy deindustrialization of europe and other we, we know what they want from all that but uh, we still don't know if this is just for the so-called golden billion which are not golden billion because most of those living in the among the golden billion they they, they don't have even a few thousand not to imagine uh, <laughs> millions or billions so it was the, the zero point zero zero one percent inside the golden billion uh, your atlanticist elites etc so they want a world only for them and the rest is going to be a sort of gigantic uh, digital version of uh, Foucault's panopticon where everybody's under surveillance and and you own nothing and you will be happy which is the standard Klaus Schwab motto, uh, and what for? So what, what kind of planet is that? You know, you, you have the 0.00.1% controlling everything, and you have disappearing middle classes and working classes practically starving. And uh, what, what kind of economy you're going to have? You're going to have an economy that only works for a few hundred million people, and the rest are condemned to... Uh, sub-Saharan Africa kind of existence. 
Is yeah. that, so, so there are many questions on uh, because they 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 launched this narrative, they launched this gigantic great reset now great narrative operation. They are uh, working in the background towards this goal, but we don't know exactly what what the ultimate goal is. It's it's so you know it's uh, it's a sinister plot in fact because. Uh, what they uh, make explicit is just uh, the tip of the iceberg. Yeah, I mean, during right before the G20 leading into it, uh, the what struck me was this conflict where you had, you said the generals, right? The few Pentagon generals. You, you had Mark Milley, who is no, he is no peacenik. He is he's not, no uh, exactly. he is a hawk. He, yeah. uh, he's at the chiefs of staffs now, but he's played, a central role in in the American empire, but he just uttering, right? Just uttering the need to talk with Russia and come to peace, uh, create a firestorm to the point where the Department of State, the State Department, which is supposed to be about diplomacy, came out against Mark against, Milley, saying yes. that this that that's not responsible, that Ukraine, and it's always couched in Ukraine needs to determine its own destiny. Meanwhile, everything you're saying, and I think, it's it's very true that uh, the this this warmongering this uh, war machinery leading us to the brink of nuclear war really is about satisfying predatory finance capital. I mean, Michael Hudson also talks about this. He's mm -hmm. been on this show, and we, you know, and he talks all about finance capital. And I think that's so that's a hundred percent true. You just see how this is playing out. Ukraine itself has basically sold its entire economy to Wall Street at this point has yeah. get, gotten rid of any vestige of what could be considered workers' rights or uh, a planned economy or a public sector, Every all of it, right? Uh, it's either gone or it's going to be gone very soon. So, um, you know, no matter what happens, it seems like, it seems like predatory finance, the, these uh, financiers on Wall Street, Downing Street, uh, they win, right? And, and, yeah. and it leads to, and it's leading to, and I, I don't necessarily think that this is entirely in their control in this respect in terms of how the military conflict plays out, right? How it's playing out, uh, I don't think they control it. They they, yeah. they they release the forces, the military industrial complex, for example, release them. And then now we we see where it, it's gone, right? And, and the sanctions and all of that, we've seen where it's all gone. Uh, quickly though, any any final reactions and you know uh, anything else you'd like to add before yeah, uh, before I let there, you go? There's one, there's one thing I love I love to add, Denny. The Russians are driving the Americans and NATO stand crazy, literally, literally, because uh, it's the Russian concept of uh, strategic ambiguity. You never know exactly what they're gonna do next, and they keep. You know, they leave you wondering. Uh, and then one day, they, they, there's, there's a whoosh. For instance, this decision that they took to have uh, General Armageddon, Surovikin, as the overall commander of the not special military operation anymore. Now it's a counter-terror operation because they basically designated Ukraine as a terrorist state with this uh, sequence of terrorist acts, you know. So it's a counter-terrorism. And now they are not saying it explicitly, but now everybody knows that this thing is not going to stop at Donbass. There's going to be a regime change. They are going all the way to Kiev and Lviv, and there's going to be a regime change. Whatever it takes, and if it takes years, they don't care. So this is, this is driving Washington and Brussels completely nuts. First of all, because we already seen uh, in a matter of a few months that NATO, not only they have uh, depleted arsenals, they don't have troops. And even if they wanted to amass, what, 100,000 troops to, to go uh, against Russia inside Ukraine, it's not enough. Because Russia now is going to have 300,000 or maybe 500,000. And if they call another partial mobilization, they can get to 1 million if they want. And the Russians finally came to the conclusion that they were postponing since the beginning. Uh, and this, uh, this is something that you, you see discussions among the top Russian military analysts. And these guys are pros. They are, they, they are not ideological at all. They, they, they are uh, physics, mathematics, uh, uh, 
logic of war and what's happening on the ground. They said, no, we're going, we're going to have to take over practically everything because it's it's basically a psychotic regime, which whatever we do, they're going to have uh, weapons pointed at us uh, for the foreseeable future. So you have to get rid of it. So uh, nobody was expecting this to happen so soon. And in fact, a lot of uh, Russian public opinion from the beginning said, you should have done this in February, not now. But, but the point is, this is not a war. And in Putin's mind and in the minds of the Security Council, the guys who really decide uh, side by side with Putin, like Patrushev, uh, Medvedev, which is they listen to him. Uh, okay, uh, it, this is a police operation to what? Denazify this place and demilitarize this place so they won't be a threat to, a, to Russophone people in the Donbass and ultimately to us in Russia. Obviously, it was not enough. So, you know, so what we're seeing now is, okay, so now we're going to really, we, we're going to step up our game. Now, now it's de-electrification, which is what, that's that's why I, my column is called Electric War. Right. Now it's de-electrification as a path towards final demilitarization and denazification, which this process is much longer, denazification, because the Americans have invested in the nazification of Ukraine for years, if not decades. Right. So, and that, the whole thing, what does NATO have against it? Not, and what the Americans have against it, uh, uh, sort of a, a direct clash against Russia, which, exactly, the guys in the Pentagon don't want it. The neocons and the neoliberal cons want it because they're politicians and they don't know shit about war. But the Pentagon generals, they look at it and no, we don't want this. Nobody wants this because we know what's going to happen next. So I think this is, this is where we are at the moment. The moment of uh, the collective West is paralyzed the way these things are going. The Russians having, I would say, a basket of options. Okay. Okay, we can end this in 20 minutes. Ah, no, nah, no. Nah, sure. We can end this in a few days. Nah, right. we can end this in a few weeks. No, we can, we can end it for a few months. Oh, we can end this in a few years. And nobody knows what they're going to choose. <laughs> Well, well, Pepe, it was a real uh, pleasure to have you back on the program. Uh, I feel like in just an hour, we uh, really got a short course on everything that's going on that's important right now, at least the big points in geopolitics. Um, everyone stick around. Uh, be sure to follow Pepe Escobar on Telegram. I thank am uh, putting his Telegram in the chat. But uh, Excellent. Yeah, thank and, you and, very much. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah, uh, maybe Twitter will get me back, but I'm not counting. Uh, on it. Yeah, <laughs> well, Elon Musk has not been too generous. He just uh, knocked out uh, Garland Nixon and uh, hasn't really. really? He, he knocked. Uh, so, so Garland Nixon is out. He's out, and I so see. is um. And Scott Ritter came back for not too but long, Scott and then he was back out for one day, and the next day they yeah, they got rid of it. Again. And I'm on a last strike, so any so whenever NAFO trolls or Taiwan trolls, whenever they uh get really thirsty, uh, I'm probably on my way out too. Honestly, oh my God. Uh, um, but at least you're still there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. For for now, um. But anyway, it was really good talking to you, Pepe. We will Thank be you. back in touch soon. Stick around, everyone. I'll be uh, on for another half much. hour or so. Take good care. Thank you. Bye. All right, everyone. That was a really great conversation. Um, be sure to um, um, be sure to continue to like this video. We're going to continue to talk here. Probably be on for another 30 minutes or so. Um, so like the video, like this video. Where are we at now? We have 907 likes, 1,300 watching. Incredible, 1,353 watching. Uh, let's try to get that to 1,000 now. Um, let's get to 1,000. I'm going to take these off. And of course, you know, this channel is completely independent. All of my work is independent. I've been doing independent journalism, anti-imperialist, socialist-oriented independent journalism for... Um, uh, 2022 now. So I've been doing this for uh, almost 10 years. Most of it's been pro bono. Now I'm trying to become sustainable. So you can join this YouTube channel as a member. I saw some members out here already. Uh, but the best way to support is on Patreon, patreon.com slash Danny If you like annual subscriptions, 
uh, Substack is also in the description of this video. Um, you can leave super chats, all of that uh, good stuff. So that was a great conversation. Uh, many thanks, of course, to Pepe Escobar uh, for all of his really um, uh, in-depth work on these developments that are of such great interest to me. And I know to all of you, as the world is rapidly changing. And to be honest, you know, I like to say that it's changing for the better and also changing for the worse, because uh, as we outline, this is a global struggle between unipolarity and multipolarity. And uh, for the worse is where uh, the collective West, the United States led collective West, the imperialist order is taking the world. And of course, uh, China, Russia, Iran, and this emerging multipolar order is taking uh, the world in a direction for the better. And so it's important to be able to demarcate these sides and understand this, understand uh, where we are heading, uh, because we all have to be active agents in this process uh, at some level, uh, regardless of what that is. And so, you know, today is so-called Thanksgiving, the National Day of Mourning. I want to put a little edit into my stream yesterday. I kept on calling it Indigenous Peoples Day. I got definitely crossed with Columbus Day. Uh, but this is considered the National Day of Mourning. Uh, especially for the Wampanoag people, uh, but really all the indigenous people, the Pequot, all of them from uh, this uh, east coast of the United States, northeast, uh, and of course, just all around the country and much of the Americas, right? Um, but Thanksgiving, uh, National Day of Mourning is being celebrated today. You know, you'll have millions of people come together, eat really dry turkey and carbo loads and all that good stuff. Um, but what's important here, I want to just say that there is a couple of uh, reasons for the American empire to be mourning and for the people of the world uh, to be engaged in that process. So you have the National Day of Mourning, we have indigenous peoples uh, really uh, emphasizing um, their history and also the current reality that indigenous people face. And I'll read an article I may read two uh, articles, uh, but I'll, I think I'll start with my own um, on this issue. Generally, I read Glenn Ford's article, but it's very long. And I don't think I have the time. I think I would need 45 minutes to an hour. And I don't have that. So I'll read my article that I wrote in 2014 about Thanksgiving, the reality of it. Um, so you have Indigenous peoples mourning this history, this current reality, this colonial plunder, really the U.S.'s first war, right? But it's It's the first war. Um, alongside the enslavement of Africans. This is the history that Putin, that even Xi Jinping, that a lot of world leaders understand. And um, it, it really is the first war that has led to this imperialist uh, system. And, and that, that's, that must be understood. But one of the reasons why the empire is mourning right now is because they're mourning their unipolar hegemony. They're mourning their domination, their ability to not only control narratives, but to control resources, to control economies, to be able to plunder as they wish, and to be able to use military force, propaganda, and uh, austerity, privatization as weapons of both social control and super exploitation. And that is becoming harder and harder to manage as countries like China and Russia and even India and uh, some of the more emergent uh, global eco South economies uh, begin to assert real political and economic leadership and begin to build these alliances like BRICS Plus, like the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, and uh, like uh, 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 you know all of these in, uh, projects like the Eurasian Economic Union and the Belt and Road Initiative, all of these projects really do threaten hegemony. It's not that China is a so-called threat to you, the U.S. or that Russia is a so-called threat to the U.S. and the West. It's not like that at all. The threat is in the direction that these countries are going in, that they are charting an independent path from imperial diktats, and that is what the U.S. and its uh, unipolar imperial order uh, that really dominates the West at this point, uh, that's what they are seeking to undermine and to destroy. And so that is the mourning process that they are going through uh, today on this Thanksgiving. But it's really important to remember this first war, this first war upon the indigenous peoples, because it's ongoing. I mean, 
the hypocrisy of the United States and the West to say that there's a genocide in China, for example, among, uh, against the Uyghur people, when Uyghurs are living better than ever, that Russia is committing some kind of genocide uh, in Ukraine when Ukraine has been ethnically cleansing and targeting Eastern Ukrainians who speak Russian, who identify as Russian, uh, the uh, just hypocrisy of the U.S.'s warfare state, its militarism, which has killed millions upon millions around the globe, mostly in global South countries, which just happen to be non-Anglo-Saxon countries. Um, uh, the hypocrisy is just, uh, you know, just incredible. But it's really important to remember this first war. And I'm going to uh, read you an article. This is back from 2014 when I wrote about Thanksgiving. And I talked about how Thanksgiving is the expression of the colonizer then and now. I mean, right now, the collective West, the U.S., is acting like a, col a, a colonial entity. That's what it's doing. That, that's why it does not like Russia and does not like China, because these countries refuse to be treated as such. Right. You always hear them saying that Russia and China are the imperialists, that they're the ones who are uh, the warmongering states. Well, actually, uh, all, everything that Russia and China is doing right now is in response. Not everything. I mean, of course, these countries have independent political and economic development paths that they would be pursuing anyway. However, a lot of what they do in response to U.S. policies, because the U.S. and its collective West vassals are acting like uh, 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 colonial entities, right? Entities that seek to bring Russia and China to heel and that seek to bring really the entire planet, the planet's majority, those 66, 75 percent of the world's population that stand with Russia and China in the global south. Uh, that's who they want to continue to dominate. That happens to be the richest parts of this planet, the most profitable parts of this planet. So I just want to read this quickly, just so we, you know, just so we get a, a Thanksgiving reminder, right? Of what this is all about. So I said at this stage of history, most people outside of the U.S. know that the dominant narrative, narrative of Thanksgiving is a pack of lies. But in the U.S., this isn't the case. White supremacy and imperialism have shaped all aspects of life, making Thanksgiving Day a politically useful tool for the ruling system. Every November, the ruling class greases its misinformation machine to erase its history of genocide and colonialism from historical memory in place of the mist of white benevolence. President Lincoln started this process by making Thanksgiving a national holiday in 1863 to revive white racial solidarity in the midst of a civil war that threatened to tear apart the nation. Ever since, white America and broad sections of the oppressed have sat down to a meal once a year to quote-unquote celebrate the supposedly peaceful dinner between the Wampanoags of New England and the English settlers in 1621. Historians differ on the facts of the 1621 feast, and some believe the Wampanoags were not even invited at all. Others believe Lincoln distorted the story from a multitude of meals because the English depended upon the Wampanoags for survival. Yet the significance of the Thanksgiving narrative is not limited to the facts of the meal. The same forces that plundered New England and North America remain the rulers of the imperialist system they set into motion. This historical truth is why Thanksgiving continues to be an American tradition. For Amer white America and the tiny minority of people around the world with a stake in U.S. imperialism, the truth of Thanksgiving is worthy of the highest degree of suppression. The task of resistance forces, freedom fighters, and those who are interested in revolutionary organizations is to keep historical memory alive so we can erase the forces of suppression from existence. So this is all about the truth, all right? All about the truth. And the truth is that the English settlers who supposedly took part in a peaceful dinner with the Wampanoags went on a hunting expedition of each and every indigenous tribe in the region in their quest for expansion. It wasn't until the settlers decimated the Wampanoags and traveled further into the New England region that Thanksgiving really began. In 1637, the English colonizers massacred the Pequod tribe in what is now Connecticut. Over 700 Pequods were killed in the massacre. Governor John Winthrop declared the day, quote unquote, Thanksgiving. After each subsequent massacre, the settlers would celebrate, would celebrate in gratitude for their plunder by giving thanks. Since Thanksgiving was made a, a national holiday, the history, culture, and self-determination of existing indigenous nations and peoples have been officially usurped by decadent rule, white decadent rule. Racism permeates so deeply into American culture that some believe indigenous people don't exist at all. Scholarship like Roxanne Dunbar teases indigenous people's history of the United States is ignored in academia and popular culture. The living and breathing struggle of indigenous peoples against the Keystone Pipeline and other violations, this is before Standing Rock, 
or at least the big demonstration against it, and other violations of sovereignty remain outside of American political discourse. But the plight of indigenous peoples in continental North America is not merely a side story of the imperialist system. Rather, it marks the beginning of capitalist development and white supremacy in North America. The early English capitalists and colonizers paraded their colonial missions in North America as a service to civilization of the native. As the capitalist economy developed, plantation elites created a system of white supremacy to empower every white settler to protect the profits of chattel slavery. Today, the U.S. empire civilizes oppressed people of the world, quote unquote, civilizes with a heavy dose of super exploitation and repression. The difference between then and now is that instead of the ruling class rising to prominence off the backs of oppressed people, imperialism is crashing and burning. So I was talking about the empire crashing and burning in 2014. So I just want to make that note that, you know, a lot of people now are talking about the decline of U.S. hegemony. Uh, but this is a conversation I've been having since the uh, latter period of the Obama era because, uh, and I'll get to why, but uh, th because of all of these contradictions that have led to this crisis in Ukraine, that has led to the new Cold War in China and Russia, all of it uh, was already becoming very quite apparent at this time. So the inevitable and permanent crisis of imperialism have left the ruling class weaker politically and economically. The ruling class has been forced to lash out on the world with its military to maintain, maintain power. Both domestically and abroad, U.S. imperialism terrorizes oppressed people and frames it as a colonial mission, albeit in different language than 17th century colonialism. When the U.S. teamed up with its reactionary allies in NATO and the Gulf Cooperation Council to overthrow Libya and commit mass genocide of Libya's black population, the imperialists framed it as a quote-unquote humanitarian intervention. The entire war on terror, from the drone strikes to the military interventions, has been dressed up as a Western rescue mission supposedly designed to save inferior peoples in need of imperial medicine. And I want to say that with Ukraine now, we saw kind of a Europe Europeanization of Ukraine. You remember? Remember the beginning of the conflict all the way into now? Ukraine is Europe. Ukraine is a democracy. Now there's a little bit less of that as it's been harder to control the narrative. And uh, uh, Ukraine has become so unhinged that it just uh, continues to <laughs> expose itself as the corrupt puppet state that it is. But nonetheless, here there's always a narrative, right, of the superiority complex of the white, lily white European so-called so quote-unquote civilized countries against the barbarous authoritarian, right, uh, uh, China and Russia, the Eastern hordes, right? That That's the narrative we've heard during the Ukraine crisis. So um, still that savior complex is very much intact. And it is important to an analyze U.S. imperialism uh, at the point of the source or return to the source. What U.S. imperialism does abroad is directly connected to the struggle of impressed people in the belly of the beast. Well, Mike, so this is 2014. I was talking about Michael Brown being murdered in Ferguson by the police establishment and uh, writing an article about that and how the military industrial complex, U.S. militarism abroad is a direct expression of militarism at home. I talked about, uh, you know, I'm not going to read, maybe I won't read this whole thing because you all know about Darren Wilson and the large protests. A lot has happened since then. But I talk about how the conditions in places like Ferguson and Libya and wherever the U.S. wreaks havoc really teaches the lesson. This is the real lesson of Thanksgiving. It's not only about the existence of a racist mythology that continues to mislead people, but it's also about the reality of the colonizer living on through U.S. imperialism. And that's why we need an internationalist movement, a peace movement. Um, uh, the need for this has not never been stronger. And so I was talking about the resistance axis of the global south and the neocolonial world fighting for survival and self-determination in that black American indigenous peoples and workers and documented peoples, everyone, uh, they all have a common thread here. There is a common thread of this violence. And so the imperialist overlords that create these conditions for their own profit and geopolitical power are the same, whether we're talking about Libya, Palestine, Ukraine, or Ferguson. So I was talking about Ukraine in 2014 as well. Self-determination is becoming impossible to stop as the people fight back and Wall Street loses control of its inevitable cycles of crisis. Now is the time to fight back to win. So join, start an organization dedicated to overthrowing the system that created Thanksgiving. This will bring us closer to the day where we can all give thanks to peace, justice, reparations, and socialism. 
in the very real sense. So I wrote that in 2014. Uh, that's my article. I can put it in the, um, if you want to share it around to your friends, uh, especially for us Americans out here. Um, but I just want to share that those thoughts about Thanksgiving because, you know, uh, this is the day that we're in. I chose to focus on geopolitics today. That's mainly the focus of this channel. Uh, but you all know my background. And so some, you know, some in the uh, geopolitics crowd, uh, we there's a wide array of ideological persuasions. I'm very open that I am a socialist. However, uh, 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 I would distinguish myself and probably a lot of my audience who considers themselves socialists from the real cringy, really liberals that exist in the socialist movement who do not oppose empire who cannot really work with anyone else, who don't know how to promote uh, politics that we really need to understand, developments that we really need to understand around the world. They don't promote international solidarity or cooperation. Um, you know, that's really what I'm about. And, uh, you know, it's been a shame to see culture wars and identity politics, whether it's on the liberal side or whether it's on the more so-called conservative GOP side. Uh, these forces have so uh, uh, distorted the reality of the situation that we can't even talk about how indigenous people in the U.S., uh, they face police violence at a rate much higher than anyone else. Uh, 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 even black people in the United States, right? I think it's slightly higher. And we can't even relate that to the fact that P Palestinian people, that people in Donbass, right, are being terrorized by the same military state. And that's been my message since the beginning of my journalistic work is that we do have common bonds, right? There is a direct relationship to what happens abroad, to what the war machine, to what NATO is doing abroad, into the suppression, the censorship, all of it that happens at home, uh, that, there, that that's a in connection we need to make because uh, we see the rudiments of it already happening. People are get, getting angry about all of these tens of billions going to Ukraine. And while the economic situation for majorities in the U.S. and the West crumble. But it's even deeper than that. That's a really great point we need to hit on. But it's even deeper than this. What's going on is deeper. Uh, and we can be proactive. We can talk about what real cooperation is, what genuine unity is, not just a unity of, oh, well, we need to get together with us Americans and make America better. Well, we need to also make the world better by promoting self-determination, sovereignty, and the capacity to work together on common problems that we face. And one of those common problems is the war machine, right? Certainly, we're not facing, let's say, what people in Donetsk are facing with the shelling and uh, the massacring, the war crimes of the Ukrainian military. We're not facing what necessarily Palestine is facing in that direct occupation. Uh, but we have sections of the population, indigenous uh, nations, uh, black Americans in poor, oppressed uh, communities. We have uh, working class people, right, facing the violence of austerity every single day. This is not disconnected. This is very much connected. And we should be making these connections uh, as much as we can, because that is how we build a, a real movement, right? That's how we get into the process of making history rather than just being a spectator of it, or worse, being a, a complicit in the ruling class's uh, agenda for what history will look like, meaning that we go along with that program and we end up not only losing from it, but being on the enemy side of uh, what is a genuine struggle going on right now to change the world, to change the world for the better to make it a more fair place, to make it more multipolar, to ensure that there is an independent economic and political project that uh, countries, oppressed nations around the world can come together on to build up their standards of living and make uh, uh, the conditions that people live on not just tolerable, but ones that are fit for human life and for all of the advancements that everyone deserves at this stage of economic development. Some could call that communism, uh, whatever you call it, uh, that's really the reality uh, and the material reality on the ground is we have too much abundance and too much capacity to allow warmongers 
to basically not just blow up humanity's chance of survival, but also blow up humanity's chance of really ensuring that we all have what we need and then we can pursue what we want in a way that is rational and uh, that makes sense for both us and the planet that we inhabit. So with that said, everyone, you know, we're hitting in the 90 minute mark. I'm going to thank the super chats. Um, uh, Pepe did ask one, did answer one question. I didn't ask the whole question. Um, but one of my Patreon subscribers asked, will the U S employ nuclear conflict to maintain hegemony? Why or why not? Pepe answered that question. I won't be able to get to the other questions on this stream. Uh, but my subscribers on Patreon submitted questions and I will be sure to return to them um, in future streams. But I want to thank the Super Chats. I want to thank everyone on Patreon who subscribed. Uh, I want to thank um, a new subscriber. Um, thank you against Neocon Errant. Appreciate it. Um, and I'm going to thank the Super Chats now. If you have a Super Chat question, you can leave that. Um, and, and maybe I'll be able to get to it. Or I'll, uh, maybe I'll answer one more. But let's see. Let me see how much time I have after I thank the Super Chats. Keep liking this video. We still have 1,000 viewers on. Oh, look, we have 1,100 likes. So thanks so much for uh, bringing that up. Um, and of course, you know what to do. Uh, if you're not giving Super Chats, you can support and you can't come to all these streams. You can support monthly. That's the best way to sustain this work on Patreon at patreon.com slash Danny Haifong. There's Substack for annual subscriptions. Um, and there's all kinds of other ways. Rockfin.com. You can um, uh, uh, you can leave a tip, okay? So um, rockfin.com slash uh, the left lens. And I'm streaming there right now. So thank you to everyone over at Rockfin. So thank you, Vincent Hualt, who said, look at NATO's flag and tell me what you see. I see fascism. Um, that's what I see. I don't know about you all, you all, but that's what I see. I do think... Uh, uh, NATO is a fascist entity. And I, I'm just going to go come right out and say it. Thank you, JF, for the uh, super sticker. Thank you, JM, who's a member. Thank you, all my YouTube members. And thank you for JM for being a generous member and leaving that super sticker as well. Um, or super chat, I should say. Uh, let me see. Anyone else? Anyone else? Um very lively chat. Thanks you. Thank you all. Uh, uh, Pepe was certainly breaking it down. Uh, thank you, Babylon. Babel, Babel on. <laughs> thank you for the super uh, uh, sticker or chat. Um, thank you, Stephen Bateman, um, for your uh, uh, for your super chat. Thank you, Cam Lee, for your super sticker. That's uh, very much appreciated. Um, let's see if there's anyone. Okay. No, I don't think there will be anyone else. Cause I see people talk about the echo. Oh, I see JM. Thank you again so much JM, uh, for your generous, uh, support. Um, all right. So thank you so much, um, uh, for your support. Um, so you're going to Patreon right now. That's really that's really very much appreciated. I really, uh, really do appreciate that. Um, if you prefer annual, Substack is also there as well. Um, basically, on Patreon, I do a lot of I, I I publish the clips. I do some special things with my subscribers on Patreon. Um, I announce things first there, generally well in advance to anyone else, if possible. I also like to. Um, you know, I've now added tiers. So for those who can give the maximum about twenty dollars a month, um, they're they're able to give suggestions, message me about suggestions. Honestly, all my subscribers can do that. I'm not going to keep too big of a track of that, but really, you know, I try to make it an interactive process um, so you all can feel a, a bit involved. But I don't generally put many things behind a paywall, and so uh, what you'll find is just early notification. I, I give announcements there first. I try to interact a little bit personally with folks uh, just so you feel like, you know, you're getting something out of it. So 
Shout out to Julian Assange, says Jamila. Thank you so much for the super chat. And yes, uh, shout out to Julian Assange. Uh, let's free him and all U.S. political prisoners, all political prisoners held by the collective West. Um, let's do that. Definitely. Julian Assange is definitely a victim of that process of that repression censorship. Um, uh, he exposed war crimes and he is being punished for it. He's also, um, he's also, uh, being punished for doing what is completely and utterly not allowed, which is connecting, um, uh, connecting these war crimes to the actual political establishment. I believe that's one of the reasons why this uh, war uh, on him was intensified. It wasn't just because he exposed Iraq uh, war crimes. It was also because he ended up leaking, or at least uh, WikiLeaks ended up uh, leaking for all of us to rightfully see all the ways in which this intelligence apparatus, this warfare state operates uh, 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 at the behest of a political establishment, right? Um, that was what a lot of the Vault 7 leaks were about showing what the, how the lengths the United States will go uh, to wage these dangerous wars and how it implicates people like Hillary Clinton and the DNC and others, not just uh, one side of it, right? Not just one side. So, um, yeah, this was, this was a really good um, conversation with Pepe. Uh, uh, you know, it is, uh, 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 thank you so much for all coming out. I'm glad to see so many people. Uh, I don't know if you have it on the background, if you're doing Thanksgiving festivities or maybe, you know, I know, uh, I have, I'm getting in a larger international audience and I know most people around the world don't really do this. Don't really do the whole, let's eat uh Turkey and celebrate a mythology of the United States. Um, but it's really good to see so many of you come out today. Really, really, really uh, uh, appreciated. Uh, I definitely want to thank all my moderators and everyone in the chat, but especially the moderators who make uh, the chat uh, uh, work because the spam there and also trolls. Like it's one thing to troll a chat in a way that's uh, maybe you're bored, but to do it in a disrespectful way, it's really great to have moderators to keep that in line because you know people want to use the chat function. Uh, uh, and, and make it useful. So, so thank you so much for doing that as well. Um, I want to, um, you know, maybe I can get to one Patreon question. All right. Um, before I leave, cause I, I do think I can stay on for another, let's say 10, 15 minutes. And so that would give me enough time to, uh, answer some, um, Patreon questions. So, uh, one that was asked was, uh, so I want let, let's talk about the great reset a bit, actually. Um, well, actually, no, let me, let me actually go to another one. Uh, well, no, let me talk about the great reset. Maybe I can, I, I can, um, <laughs> Maybe I can answer two questions in one because I have a really interesting questions about the Great Reset. And the the they asked, um, I've heard about the so-called Great Reset. What is it exactly and why does it require dominating China as, um, oh, geez, um, as wouldn't the future still need its workers and its investment in and development of, quote unquote, ecological civilization? So this is interesting because I'm not an expert on the Great Reset. Um, I know it comes out of the World Economic Forum. And I know it has, you know, it has this real vibe to it. My opinion is that it really is a big business project to try to reform big business, make it look like it is um, interested in pandemics, interested in the environment. But really what it's interested in is increasing shareholder value, um, increasing profits, right? Increasing the profits of capitalism, capitalists, while um, cosplaying concern for the environment, cosplaying concern for, let's say, public health, cosplaying concern for economic inequality. I really do see the Great Reset as being 
this kind of alliance of they call themselves the stakeholders, right? Uh, whether it's political elites, whether it's capitalists, whether it's investors, whether, you know, uh, think tank uh, people, people in journalism. I really do think that's what it's about. What I don't think it's about where I disagree with some on this question is that it's somehow more than capitalism. I've heard that. I've heard that it's more than capital. It's like a, it's like another phase of capitalism. I don't agree with that because the stage of capitalism we are in now, imperialism, is very much the reality, right? And we talked about with Pepe, right? Predatory finance capital. About those are the masters of imperialism. Those are who are in the vanguard. Those are who really dictate how this system takes shape. Uh, their interests are primary, and I think in the Great Reset, that's very much the case. But I do think that what has happened and why the Great Reset exists, why it's talked about so much, uh, why these forces have uh, maybe an undue weight in the political and economic trajectory of, let's say, the collective West, is because we do have this era of massive abundance, but yet uh, incredible amounts of inequality. You had a pandemic that brought the world to an earth-shattering economic crisis, a hunger crisis, all kinds of things. And you also have ecological catastrophe. And so uh, uh, the reason for something like a Great Reset is to cosplay some kind of reform to make capitalism more effective and more stable. I think it's a complete utter failure. I think it's lent itself to a lot of attacks. I think that the reason why there's so many suspicions about it is because it really is used as a tool. It's just one of the many tools, right? Davos is one of the many tools to kind of generate and regenerate the um, uh, the interests of these predatory finance capitalists and to rebrand them as somehow more humanitarian and interested in things like uh, uh, more equality, right? Because when someone like Klaus Schwab says, uh, uh, be happy and own nothing, it's not that he's trying to say you all should be peasants, right? Uh, how it, even though that is very much the case, uh, a finance capital definitely wants people to own nothing because they want to own everything. However, what they're trying to say is that uh, this kind of form of ownership, private ownership, they're trying to act like they care about socialization, that people don't need to own things to be happy, that we can live in a more fair society. That's really what they're trying to say, but they do it so poorly because it's obvious what they really want. They want more, more of a capacity to steal from the world with a, a, a better branding on it. That's basically what it is, a better brand. You can steal more without, um, without coming under any scrutiny. So that's my, uh, uh, that's, my, that's my opinion on the Great Reset. And so with China, what's interesting is um, you would think, yes, that actually um, – there are some people who think China and the Great Reset are like one, right? However, there is a, a lot of hostility, right? Um, on the one hand, China does participate in the World Economic Forum. Not only does it participate in the World Economic Forum, but it has uh, participated in this whole Great Reset, a uh, Fourth Industrial Revolution uh, narrative. And it does so on a different basis because... China actually holds weight to what it does and to what it says. So China is all about modernizing. China is all about investment infrastructure. China really is about literally uh, 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 abolishing the need for this, um, you know, this this massive inequality. It's trying to create the material conditions for that to be possible. So. When China takes part in these things, it's to build better relations with the West while also forwarding what is its own agenda, which is to actually take, quote unquote, ecological civilization uh, seriously, to take uh, the restoration of it very seriously, to take investments in infrastructure very seriously, and to um, um, get rid of inequality in a very serious manner and to reduce it and to eventually uh, abolish it altogether. So uh, there needs to be a distinct distinction there. So, yes, China is very much a key part of the global economy. and That's not going to change. And you would think, and I think that's why the Great Reset folks try to 
uh, hedge their bets. They try to hold um, a lot of different things together. But one of the things they say is that while they understand China is uh, becoming a more um, uh, assertive force in the global economy, um, they really are distrustful. So they talk a lot about trust, right? And that's because the Great Reset's kind of a fraud in that it's not going to be able to build more trust because it's controlled by predatory finance capitalists who also see China as a threat. So it's this massive contradiction, but it really is what I think is a, a rebrand of liberalization. Not liberals like Democrats, not liberals like um, some kind of political theory or a, a political thought process, but liberalization meaning how to forward what is out of the bag, right? Which is massive privatization at the end of any kind of social or public sector, uh, the massive plunder of finance capital, how to keep that going, but with a different framework, with one that is more palatable, right? Where maybe countries around the world, people around the world, people everywhere can be bamboozled into thinking that this is a project that they can throw their weight around. That to me is what is so concerning about something like the Great Reset, not about any kind of like um, agenda that we don't know. I think I think the agenda is quite clear. The agenda is uh, a plunder, pillage, and uh, any policy or action that will get them there. That that, that will get uh, us there. That's that's really what I think about it. Um, but um. All right. So for uh, subscribers on Patreon, um, I want to uh, integrate also uh, another person asked about. Um, it's it's kind of more of a prompt talking about effective communication being a call to action. Uh, it's not enough to inform the public. Uh, can you guys please give specific actions that we need to be taking? Raising awareness is not enough. I'm an enthusiast of our mutual cause. But I'm completely lost how to put all this knowledge into action short of joining communist insurgency in the Philippines. I try supporting causes locally, but every single group of activists I join ends up being a front for either the George Soros Open Society, the Democratic Party, or a Rockefeller Foundation group, not exaggerating. So I didn't ask this with Pepe because Pepe is traveling the world. Um, this seems more like a question for someone in the United States who's interested in multipolarity, anti-imperialism, socialism. I want to, um, this is, this is very, very, very important because yes, the information we have, we need to be taking action around. That's a hundred percent true. Um, however, it's a tough, it's a tough situation because I do think that, uh, we need to be joining organizations. Yes. We need to be doing what we can't, what, where we need to be plugging in where we feel like we can plug in. Meaning we all have different skills. We all have different approaches. Not everyone is going to be a, a, a committed member to an organization, but certainly join organizations. You know, I love Black Alliance for Peace. I think that there are organizations out there in the U.S. Um, that can serve a role and can really, um, you know, do great work around raising anti-imperialist consciousness. But I think that, you know, we're going to be running into contradictions constantly. I mean, the U.S. is the most propagandized country in the world. It is an empire. It's a crumbling empire. And there really isn't a mass movement right now that is powerful enough to shift that dynamic, meaning that that propaganda is still very much influential and people are very much struggling. So I, you know, my my recommendation is always, you know, uh, kind of an assessment. What do you think is your role in the movement? Ask yourself that first. What is your role in if you are passionate about a mutual cause, like let's say anti-imperialism? What do you think you can offer, right? And then you bring that either to organizations, to projects, to wherever you feel like you can. Uh, uh, to, you know, not everyone's, some people are going to be journalists. Some people are going to be writers. Some people are going to be uh, uh, pundits and analysts. 
Some people are going to be organizational leaders. Some people are just going to be rank and file in organizations. Some people are going to just form study groups. I think that's perfect, uh, uh, an incredible way of, uh, you know, um, moving things forward, right? Because really the crisis in the United States is political education. It's education. It's understanding what's going on. And so anything we can do to forward that, sometimes it's through actions. Sometimes it's through talking to your coworkers as you're in a common fight, whether that's uh, whether you're fighting for a union, you're in a union, you're fighting your boss, whether you're in a mass organization, a public, some kind of organization, and, and you're coming up with these contradictions. Do you have allies? Can you talk to that? Can you peel them? Can you win them over to your side? And then can you chart a different path either in that organization or outside of it right there's so many things but for me you know i can only speak from my experience and from those of others i've spoken to is that it's it's always a process right it's always a process we're not going to find the the 100 percent right thing we should be doing uh, all the time because that's not how living in the material world is the material world is full of contradictions we live under a system we do live under a system of class rule full of warmongers that are bringing our existence more and more precarious, that are bringing our existence to a more and more precarious position. So do we then just, uh, uh, there's, two, there's two particular places we can go that I think are damaging. Do we go to nihilism and say, throw up our hands, we give up, we're just going to live as best we can. We're going to become narrow, right? self-interested people. Um, individualistic people. We're just going to uh, uh, leave this all behind, right? Or the other side, which is, you know, I guess you could say in principle is not as incorrect, but couldn't be just as damaging, which is jump in to work so intensely that we can't handle it, that we are trying to push forward. We're almost trying to do a great leap forward as an individual and move past the conditions around us to the point where we burn out, where we become frustrated, where we can end up in that same nihilistic place and end up doing more of a disservice because we're engaging in collective work and affecting other people now, right? Now we're affecting the ability of others to be able to affect uh, change. So, so it's a very delicate process. And uh, at this time, I would say that first and foremost, everybody, like I, I've had to do this so many times in my life over the last just decade alone, right? What do I offer? Am I, do I organize protests? Am I a speaker at protests? Am I, um, do I, am I more of an administrative person? Am I more of uh, uh, someone who's into political education? Am I more of a writer? Am I more of a journalist? Am I someone who wants to be organizing direct actions around very concrete things, right? No matter what it is, there's a place for you, but certainly it's not going to be uh, perfect by any stretch of the imagination, right? There are anti-war organizations. There's UNAC. There's Black Alliance for Peace. Um, you know, uh, people are organizing labor unions right now. Uh, uh, there's always going to be an anti-racist movement in the United States at some level. But that co-optation, you're not going to escape it. That's always going to be present. There's only certain issues where you won't find the co-optation so much as you'll find ideological confusion and reactionary politics, meaning like the questions that I focus on, like let's say China, Russia, multipolarity, you're not going to find Rockefeller, Soros funded organizations trying to co-op that message. What they will do though is, what the elites do is they find ways to demonize your message to the point of uh, justifying censorship. And so that's what you'll run into there meaning you'll have a smaller pool, especially in the collective West, from which to organize with to begin that process of changing the narrative and hopefully bringing more and more people into the fold of what a real peace movement would look like. So, you know, it's probably not a satisfactory answer for my Patreon subscriber, but, um, you know, that's, that's what I would say. Uh, and, and I think study, learn, and then educate others, if there's a bare minimum, that is something that, you know, and that's within your capacity, then that is something to engage in always because 
it's a just it, there's just such a fervent need for it and uh you'll be surprised by how many people you will uh, affect and you will impact and, and i can just say alone in just my personal life you know how many people and my wife and i talk about all the time how many people have we known become close to and watched as they hear us see us see lead by example do what china does right lead by example and you'll see that people as conditions change they will respond especially ordinary people maybe if you're among i don't know how many ruling class people i have in my audience but if you're one of those maybe you'll see less of that <laughs> as they pearl clutch uh, uh, uh but you know the fact of the matter is is that a lot of ordinary people people who do not have a stake in the empire or do not have a large one uh, they will change they will change their mind right because ideology without that material stake is more is flimsier than we think flimsier than we think um i just want to say thank you to this new member so thank you so much mjr for becoming a member of this channel thank you so much um so you can become a member on this YouTube channel. It's a great way to support. So, you know, I'm answering my subscriber questions. Um, one person has a bunch. Um, and then I'll just do one more. What are your thoughts on the situation in Syria before I close out here? Uh, we talked a little bit about Syria yesterday. I mean, we have this interesting uh, uh, Turkish kind of operation happening. Um You know, the U.S. is not happy with what's happening in Syria uh, with Turkey. I don't know if Syria is happy about it because uh, Syria has not been happy with Turkey's role in the occupation of Syria. That's for sure. Northern Syria. But at the same time, uh, Turkey is definitely conducting this operation, not because it wants to terrorize Syria, but because it wants to send a message to the United States, because you know that the United States has been funding and arming uh, uh, Kurdish elements in northern Syria to participate in this occupation. And Turkey has engaged in this occupation for the reason of uh, uh, fighting these forces, because Turkey has a huge conflict with the Kurds. So now Turkey has escalated it and has done so in a way that puts uh, potentially U.S. assets at risk of being targeted. The reason they did this is because of the terrorist attack in Istanbul, which Turkey has labeled the U.S. as being to blame for. And that's because of the U.S.'s role in funding these Kurdish forces, which Turkey claims are responsible. So uh, the situation in Syria is very serious because the proxy war is still ongoing. So, of course, Syria is not really benefiting from any of this. Uh, I'm sure Syria won't mind if occupation forces take a hit. But at the same time, uh, neither have permission to be there. So we have that baseline. Um, we have that baseline fact that neither um, uh, 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 Turkey or the United States have permission. So they're violating international law. And whatever they do, there is a war crime. So there's that aspect. And Turkey and Syria have very, very, uh, very um, complex relations but really on the negative side, really the, the relations aren't great, although they try to cooperate when they can, but they're not great because uh, Turkey uh, has engaged in the regime change operation in many respects for since the proxy war began. So the situation in Syria is, is, is a struggle, right? Because the sanctions on Syria are very much in place. Um, Israel is conducting missile strikes like every other day at this point, uh, the proxy war hasn't ended. The Syrian economy has been decimated. Syria is having trouble rebuilding, although Syria is also a member of the Belt and Road Initiative, is very much in the struggle for a multipolar world, is still able to preserve its sovereignty. But certainly where Syria was pre-2011 is nowhere where Syria is now, meaning that uh, Syria was a prosperous country. Syria was a more egalitarian country, and now U.S. sanctions and the U.S.-led military operation there has really decimated the country. And that's going to continue for quite some time because Syria won the proxy war, at least on the battlefield. Um, 
but uh, the U.S. refuses to withdraw its occupation and uh, its sanctions. And so Syria does not have any respite from the overall uh, proxy war, even though in 2016, with Russia's help and salute to the Russian forces who came to Syria's aid, with Russia's help, uh, they were able to clean up at least the uh, uh, amalgam of jihadists and terrorist uh, elements, Al-Qaeda affiliates, ISIS, etc., that were leading the charge of destabilization, right? So uh, while that has lessened to a large degree, while uh, those forces certainly do not have the same kind of influence in Syria, the sanctions are enough to create massive inflation and, and massive economic pain, hunger, Right, cutting Syria off from much of the world economy. And then you also have the airstrikes that continue in Syria. You have the U.S. building a new base there, which I covered here on this channel. Uh, you still have escalations against Syria because the projects don't end. Even when the U.S. puts its attention elsewhere, even when it says, oh, we're going to now fight a new Cold War on Russia and China, doesn't mean that every other uh, military uh, uh, intervention or, or even the war on terror overall doesn't mean it ended. It just means that now every military operation has the goal not just of uh, cementing domination in the Middle East, for example, but it has the goal of weakening Russia and China. And that's a lot of what Syria is all about. It's a lot of what the proxy war on Syria is about. So we're heading to two hours now. Um, and I think I am going to now bring this to a close. So I was able to answer a good number of Patreon questions. So that's one thing you can do. Uh, you can submit your questions on Patreon and I answer them. Uh, so if you become a subscriber on Patreon, uh, uh, help sustain this work. Uh, that's how um, I remain sustainable. That's I'm independent. I don't take money from outside sources, from corporations, from foundations, none of that. Um, so uh, 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 I am not, you know, an affiliate of any force, uh, 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 at all, as you can tell by my politics. So, you know, do, uh, subscribe on Patreon, do subscribe on Substack. Some people like the annual better because it's easier. Um, so that's great. And then, um, become a member on YouTube. That's also a really, really good way of, um, taking part in the support. Uh, so you can do that as well. So all those links in the description, you can join on YouTube in so many different ways all over the channel. You'll find that button by each video, uh, by my name on each video. And also at the top right, I believe you hit the, just see, watch for the word join. Um, and then I have another super chat, Karina. Thank you so much. Um, uh, thank you to Anti-Conquista. I'll have to have you guys on soon. Um, appreciate it. Uh, thank you so much for your generosity on this day of mourning. All right, everyone. Cheers. Take care. Um, let me just let you know. Um, I'll let you all know now. 900 people on here. Uh, uh the next guest will probably be December 2nd. And guess who it is? It's Claire Daly. I'll have the European Parliament MP, the EU MP on this show, uh, the Irish year EU MP who uh, has made a real, um, has, has, has garnered a lot of attention for anti-imperialist, anti-war positions. And so she'll be on 10 a.m. Friday, December 2nd, Claire Daly. That's who I have confirmed. So um, that's going to be really awesome. So you don't want to miss that. Um, I have, I've sent out other, um, lines, but you know, it's a busy holiday time, so I don't got them, uh, 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 any answers yet, but I'll be on again, uh, soon. Uh, it might be as soon as Saturday night or, um, early next week. All right. So, uh, uh make sure you're hitting that notifications bell here because YouTube doesn't like to notify you about things until the very last minute. All right. So hit that notifications bell, uh, subscribe to the channel, all that good stuff. I've hit 32,000 subscribers here on YouTube, so salute to all of you. you uh, this channel has been experiencing 
very steady growth, right? It's not incredible growth. It's not from uh, uh, whatever it was, 10,000 to 30,000 in a matter of days. But we are growing here and we're growing steadily. And I think we're growing in the way that we want to be growing. Um, so thanks so much for helping me hit 32,000. It wasn't not too long ago that I was like, wow, I'm never going to get to 10,000. Like I thought that, but now that I've increased my streaming uh, uh, with uh, regular clips, uh, things are are growing, and uh, you all make that happen through all of your likes, through all your subscriptions, through all of your, you know hitting that notification bell and becoming a regular part of this of this community, right? Um, so appreciate it again. Take good care, and I will see you very soon. And, and I'll announce the next live stream. Uh, when I know more. Uh, so uh, take good care. Peace out. Solidarity. And uh, uh, try not to mourn too much on this day of uh, uh, celebrating a national warmongering mythology. <laughs> Bye-bye.